Oh, my queen, said the royal sorcerer to Hatshepsut, with this amulet, you and your descendants are endowed by the goddess Isis with the powers of the animals and the elements. You will soar as the falcon soars, run with the speed of gazelles, and command the elements of sky and earth. 3,000 years later, a young science teacher dug up this lost treasure and found she was heir to the secrets of Isis. And so, unknown to even her closest friends, Rick Mason and Cindy Lee, she became a dual person, Andrea Thomas, teacher. Oh, my Isis. And Isis, dedicated foe of evil, defender of the weak, champion of truth and justice. I don't want you to get involved. I guess I should go to the police. The police? How serious is this? Serious enough. Welcome back, my friends, to an all-new episode of the Shazam! Isis podcast. It's your old mentor, John S. Drew, speaking, and we're continuing that journey down the highways and byways of the land, examining those two iconic TV shows of the 1970s, Shazam! and The Secrets of Isis. And we're knee-deep, I would say, or neck-deep in Isis at the moment because we've actually finished the second season of Shazam!, and it's just now a run of the first season of Isis until we get to their respective third and second seasons. And joining me on this journey as we continue examining these two shows is the big red cheese himself, Mr. Richard F. Lee. Hey, Richard. Well, oh, Zephyr winds that blow on high. Zip up my fly. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, hi, John. I, I didn't know you're... you're... You're the you're the principal of the. Oh hi! I didn't want to be caught misbehaving. <laughs> how so you how doing? You, I'm doing great. I, I'm just uh, looking at the comics of Shazam and Isis and getting into an Isis mood and re- enjoying and reminiscing about the secrets of Isis and having a, a blast looking at these DVDs and it brings back a lot of memories. Many of these DVD episodes I had not seen in a long time. And so I've had a chance now to go through them. And obviously we're doing episode by episode, but I've had a chance to go through all of them. And it brings back a lot of memories. Well, let me ask you this, though. I know we're talking ISIS. We're going to briefly talk about the next issue in the DC Comics run in a couple of moments. But turning this over to Shazam a moment, you got an opportunity recently to sit in on a panel about Captain Marvel with Captain Marvel himself. That's right, John. And this was at the Big Apple Comic Con that occurred in March of 2017. And it was a very interesting time because this was the first New York Comic Con that I had gone to. I actually had not been to any of the bigger ones except for San Diego uh, before, once before. And so this was an opportunity to go to the East Coast to go to a Comic-Con. And I was invited by none other than Jackson himself, Jackson Boswick, who played Captain Marvel in the first season of Shazam, as we all know, friend of the podcast. And you had invited me, John, to be there to be a part of the panel. And the gentleman who hosted the panel, Zorik, he's a nice guy. He's a friend, a friend of this podcast. He's a great guy. He's a Captain Marvel expert. He had his own Captain Marvel uh, website many, many years. I actually read that some, I want to say about 10, 15 years ago before we even thought of doing this podcast. And he's up to speed on the name Captain Marvel. It was an interesting panel because it wasn't just about Shazam. It was about the name Captain Marvel. And he informed us that the name Captain Marvel had been used by about 20 different characters over time. It originated, of course, with the 1940 comic book from Fawcett, and then it was bought out by Marvel. They appropriated the title, or stole the title, I don't think they bought it, and they used it for a number of different characters, including um, different characters, including a female character, had the name Captain Marvel. I didn't know any of that. I knew about the Captain Marvel that Marvel Comics produced, but I didn't know about the whole history of how many different characters had that name. And Roy Thomas, comics legend Roy Thomas, was with us as well. And he had come up with a lot of ideas for the Marvel version of Captain Marvel. 
And so we had a plug for the Shazam ISIS podcast. I did not participate much in the panel. I was too interested in listening to what these historians of comics had to say. And for those who are interested, you can find this on YouTube. It's been loaded up there, the AppleCon March 2017, the uh, conference on Captain Marvel, the symposium. You can find it there. And I want to thank Zorik in by this podcast for allowing me to participate in that panel. Unfortunately, the weather kept you away, John. It did. Yeah, I was supposed to make it. Uh, here it is. You fly in from the West Coast and you're able to make it. I couldn't make it down from the North. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was disappointing. I said, you know, you, you had a blizzard that came in and we understood from the weather reports, a massive snowstorm was coming in and uh, Long Island was basically shut down. And here we are in the heart of downtown Manhattan, and there's some snowflakes coming down. It was not bad. It wasn't bad in downtown Manhattan. It was cold as all get out. But for crying out loud, we had we had a, a Comic Con to attend. Don't you know, John, there are priorities in life? <laughs> so let me ask you one thing, though, because when we had Jackson on, he was clearly, uh, you know, of the opinion Captain Marvel is who you know we know him as shazam 1970s but of course he knows the whole history too himself he's pretty well versed in it how well did he keep himself from getting too annoyed when talking about marvel's stealing of the name well i don't think he was annoyed at that part of it of of during the uh, conference there i don't think he was annoyed at that part of when Marvel stole the name. Now, on other occasions, he's given interviews where he said that DC Comics blew it and did not uh, copyright the name or jump on the name as fast as they could have, so we wouldn't have to go through that whole fiasco of, is the comic titled Shazam? Is it going to be titled Captain Marvel Adventures again? And the confusion over the character's name, because most people still think of the character as Shazam, and that's that wasn't true until recently when DC decided to make the character Shazam, because so many people confused him. Uh, he didn't express displeasure at that point in the conversation, but I would recommend that our listeners watch this on YouTube themselves, and they can uh, arrive at what what was it that was actually said. Jackson covered his time on the show, so he did not address the different manifestations of what Captain Marvel was. He addressed his time on the show and how much he liked the 1940s version. And basically it's about how I feel that it's, it's the dilemma of generational dilemma of you kids get off my lawn. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Where we don't believe in any Captain Marvel, but the one we grew up with dad (laughs) Nibbit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the difference between liking the classic Star Wars trilogy versus the prequels, okay? If there's an analogy that we can draw, I think that would be a good one. I enjoyed the conversation, but because I had not followed as closely the evolution of the name Captain Marvel in the Marvel Comics run, I was not a part of the discussion because I simply didn't know. I wanted to learn along with everybody else in that room. And it was just a pleasure to be able, at the very end, to plug our podcast. And I didn't mention the podcast during the course of the conversation. It was really the topic was Captain Marvel. And we cover the Shazam ISIS television show here. My involvement and our involvement as the podcast was minimal, but it was enjoyable. And I'm glad that it was we were a part of that. Well, so, sounds like it was cool. And I will put, I'll embed it in our show notes on the Shazam ISIS podcast website so that if people want to watch it, they can see the whole panel. Yes, and there have been several pictures, including some pictures that I don't know who the photographer was who was present at the meeting with Roy Thomas and Zorik, our friend who hosted it, and Jackson, and there's me. And uh, there's a couple of other folks in there as well. Roy Thomas got an award, a Comics Lifetime Achievement Award, and uh, as soon as it was over with, photographs started appearing. And getting uploaded, and it was great. I didn't, I was not able to take a picture from where I was, so it was wonderful. That it was well documented. So the only person missing, John, was you, and you yeah. should have been there. You should have been there. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's shift gears here and continue with just a brief look here at the ISIS comic book series from DC Comics back in 1976, 77, and we moved on to issue three which I've got to admit was one of my 
more favorite ones, so to speak. It was called The okay. Wrath of Set. Yes, The Wrath of Set. And I have that comic in my hand. Now, Beware the Wrath of Set, is that correct? Beware the Wrath of Set, um, with a script by Steve Skeets, pencils by Mike Vosberg, inks by Vince Coletta. The basic story is this: the Egyptian god Set threatens to destroy Isis's city if her quote-unquote worshippers refuse to switch allegiance to him. And... This is one thing I did like about the comic series, that from time to time, she was dealing with threats that dealt with Egyptian lore. I don't think the TV show really did anything other than the fact that Isis was there. We really never got into any of the stuff with other characters from Egyptian mythology. And it also asks the question about where gods get their power from in the sense of worshippers. That is very interesting. It did introduce us to these mythological motifs, and uh, that's the first time probably any of us kids would have been exposed to that prior to taking a humanities course in college. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would be from one of these. As, but I'm a little distracted like we were the first time. I'm reading the, this issue, and Mr. Barnes is a white guy. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, they didn't get the character right as far as his visuals, but... The comic illustration of, of Andrea and Isis is a pretty close approximation, pretty close. It's not exactly the image of Joanna Cameron. I think today, with the type of art that comes out um, in Dark Horse Comics, DC, and Marvel, that you would probably have a closer approximation to the actors who played the parts. Could I just take a look at the, the artwork itself? And in this issue, you have some down-to-earth types of rescues, like kids being rescued from a burning building that kind of thing. Right. And uh, you see the the other character coming in and causing havoc as he goes along and trying to get attention. But just like the prior issue, she manages to make this god disappear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a theme of the prior issue. That's true. That was, that's, that's how it happened to the god of, of the first issue. In fact, Scarab, the first god of the, of the first issue. And so as they're exploring these different Egyptian gods and how Isis comes up and combats them, I think they had to do this. I think the writers had to do this because other established characters in the DC universe had their own rogues gallery. And Isis could not battle Lex Luthor, for example, or battle an established DC character. They had to come up with something to give her to fight, some nemesis. Imagine if and she did, though. Imagine if she could fight someone like Lex Luthor or Dr. Savannah, you mean? Yeah. I think it would be pretty easy to do. <laughs> I, I would love to see a team up with Isis and Zatanna. Hmm. You know? That could very well be a possibility in the future. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. And so, what now what's further about this issue that really sticks out to you? Well... The story itself, as I say, I just love the whole idea. It's always been something that's sort of, you know, intrigued me. I mean, I, I'm a Roman Catholic myself, but I always find it fascinating when we get this thing that a God only holds power as long as there are people there who worship. And even if they know that the God exists, if they don't worship, then they lose their power. And this is the whole thing with Set. He needs those worshippers as he looks at it. He doesn't realize that Isis is a different person now. I mean, he even sort of hints at her past, which is interesting because it will set things up for later in the run. And the uh, classic scene is at the very end of that particular story. You see Set's expression on his face like a scared dog. It's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. What what an expression. I mean, yeah. fans of the podcast, you just got to see what we're seeing. <laughs> Maybe yeah. we'll make it available to you somehow. But he disappears. He ends up go he says, these people have no respect for the gods whatsoever. I could never rule here. I have no desire to either. I shall return to ancient Egypt where the gods are respected. And he, poof, disappears. So it's like, uh, this is very similar to a Star Trek episode, Who Mourns for Adonis? Yeah. That sound familiar? Yep. Oh, yeah. That particular episode 
as a kid, I never appreciated it. But in recent watchings, I've come to appreciate more again that whole concept of gods only hold their power as long as there's someone to worship them. They sort it sort of yes. like feeds on it. Yes, I think you're right about that. I think that was the idea, one of the ideas in the episodes, one of the motifs that gods get their powers from worshippers, and that theme is replayed here. Now, uh, I don't think this has risen to the level of a cliche yet, because I haven't seen anything lately where you have that theme of gods appearing out of nowhere, needing their worshippers and their followers in order to survive, and then when they stop worshipping them, they disappear and lose their power. That's almost a cliche, you might say. Yeah. If it's been replayed in so many episodes of a sci-fi show or whatever, I can't think of any recent examples for contemporary ones. Who Mourns for Adonis is obviously the first one that comes to mind. And now we see that plot element play out in an episode or in in a, a comic, an issue of the Mighty Isis comic book. Although, I don't think that the writers had any agenda. They're just trying to entertain. Oh, yeah. But no, I, I agree. Think Yeah, they were just trying to entertain, whereas I think that in the original Star Trek series, we don't want to digress too much here, but I think in the original Star Trek series, there was an agenda. There was an agenda, because Gene Roddenberry was a devout humanist, and he was trying to uh, show through uh, illustration how humanity has evolved beyond the need for gods. I think he was trying to get that point across. I don't think that point is coming across in the Mighty Isis comic story at all. Right, yeah, yeah. Now, there's a second story in this one, and again, it's more reminiscent of the TV show. It's called Political Rally Panic. Uh, Skeets does the plot. Script by Jack C. Harris. Pencils by Jose Delbo. Inks by Coletta. And basically, there's a tornado that's threatening a political rally, but there's spiked punch that prevents Andrea from making the incantation to turn into ISIS. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's funny, uh, yeah. That's that's great, uh, but it is it is a little more down to earth. Now, you got to wonder. Uh, I'm looking at the illustrations here. Is what city is this supposed to be? It was never established in the TV show that the ISIS characters were in a large city. It was never uh, established, but this is interesting. You bring that up, and I, I'll briefly say it. We can get into more detail in the next episode. I get the impression from the fourth issue that they're on the East Coast. Uh Uh-huh. So uh, if they're on the East Coast, well, that would would make sense from the standpoint of a comic because frequently DC and Marvel would put their stories on the East Coast because these were produced on Madison Avenue back in the day. Right, yeah. And it only makes sense that you can look out the window and, and draw the building that you're next to and put it in the comic book story. But what's what's interesting about this particular story that I see here, Isis rescues a man uh, who ends up getting uh, uh, a squirt upon by a fire hydrant. Uh, no, no. what happens, he's falling, and the fire hydrant saves him from, from uh, meeting a, a, a doomed end, from my, I gather here. And... Now he's wet, and he says, thank you. I'm dreadfully sorry about causing a fuss, Miss Isis. Later on in that same page, this is the first time that I remember seeing Isis transform back into Andrea Thomas. Hmm. And again, it's not a very interesting transformation. It's just a split frame. Right. So even even the comic writers were not too creative in how to make her look like she's transforming back into or from her alter ego they could have come up with something at least with captain marvel you had a flash of lightning <laughs> yeah but they didn't really do anything with that they just went on with the story and didn't allow the transformation to interfere with the story and then they show up for uh, a speech and again a white mr barnes at the, is at the party with cindy <laughs> and rick rick mason who's not wearing his glasses now and uh, so their well, throats get paralyzed then, I guess. That's the next thing. If if I could throw out a conjecture here sure. as to why Dr. Barnes may have been white, my guess is that there was some scripts. There may have been some, uh, what do you call it, like uh, publicity photos of 
Joanna Cameron, Joanna Pang Atkins and such. There may not have been a picture of Dr. Barnes, but he may have been mentioned in some of the scripts that were given to DC in order for them to get a feel for the characters. And of course, they weren't going to, to exactly mimic the TV show. Not that they were like trying to avoid that, but they may not have even been aware that Dr. Barnes was black. They may not even have been aware that there was a recurring character of Dr. Barnes in the TV series. Mm, that's they might true. Have- they might have been aware of uh, some character named Dr. Barnes, who's a principal, but they, for all they knew, they didn't, maybe they didn't even know that he was in the show. That's true. As, especially if it was like, you know, here's four scripts and Dr. Barnes is only in one of them and he's listed as a guest star. Right. That's true. That's true. You know, and, uh, but you know, I, I got to hand it to this, this old artwork, uh, this is so different than the kind of artwork today because as a kid I'm thinking to myself it looks pretty realistic and uh, there's there's comic art that's not meant to look realistic that has exaggerated features there's mm-hmm. there's a uh, manga art from from Japan uh, this art is supposed to be realistic but then I look at it today 40 plus years later and I'm going yeah it doesn't look that realistic yeah it kind of resembles art that you might find in a catalog or something like that. But uh, whatever the case, uh, the story seems to flow. And Now, the, what I find interesting, though, and this was typical of comic books of the time. I don't know if it's true now. The background characters are, are a uniform color. They're meant to be filler, just like extras in a TV show. They're not really meant to do anything except fill the background as atmosphere. And each one of them... It's just one uniform color. Hmm. And the, this issue I have here looks purple. And the main characters, the ones in the foreground who are talking, of course you have Dr. Barnes, Rick, and you've got Cindy Lee. They're in color in the foreground. You have maybe a couple of characters that are colored also in the foreground. But they're meant to be a- atmosphere. Hmm. And It's almost like working as a, as a director. And you're thinking that a comic book really is nothing but storyboards. That's how they make TV shows and movies. They storyboard it out and do every single frame as to how they would want it to look when it gets on video or on film. Interesting. I didn't I didn't pick that up. But then again, I the only thing I picked up with as far as the art, and you mentioned the art, this is in the days before they really over-sexualized the women. And... Yeah, there's like scenes of Andrea, like even the front cover, she's on the ground, you know, almost falling in such under the eye beams of set, but nothing's over proportioned. Her boobs aren't big. Her butt isn't huge. There, there's still something that doesn't over sensualize the character. Yeah, that's true, and and you gotta admit some of the boys, who, some of the fanboys who draw the artwork, they over sexualize the character because they can't get anybody in real life. Boo boo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we've talked about this. They're doing Isis now, and she's with Black Adam and such. And aren't they drawing her like with the midriff showing? Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah they they really are. And you know. the character really do, is is attractive as the character is written and ha- exactly. as it's drawn. Yeah. It is attractive. It's very attractive. It's good artwork, and it looks like it looks like something very appealing. It'll sell a lot of issues because they really draw her really attractive. Yeah, yeah. So what happens here? They everybody loses their voice after drinking spiked punch. Is that basically? Yeah. It? <laughs> I mean, it's a silly story. It's a little bit of silly, but I could see this one being done on the TV show very easily. I could too, and so. With a spiked punch, a tornado appears. Yeah. Uh, That's convenient, okay? I don't know what's about. A convenient situation happens. Everybody's drinking spiked punch. They all lose their voices. Andrea loses her voice, too, or or almost loses it entirely. And a tornado appears, and she has to become Isis in order to save people from the tornado. So she becomes Isis, rescues everybody from the tornado— so where does the tornado come from? Does it tell us? No. No. But you got to remember, it's... we've only got a half hour. <laughs> and it just appears in a large city like that. It doesn't happen quite like that too often. Yeah. 
Actually, I found I found the uh, the advertisement for the DC Superstar stuff more interesting than the story. I'm afraid. <laughs> A, a classic Mego Batcopter goes for only five dollars and nineteen cents, plus seventy nine cents for postage and handling. Mm, those were the days. Yeah, eight inch Migos going for three seventy nine plus fifty nine cents for postage and handling. <laughs> oh, those were the days. Fifty nine cents postage and handling, and they're about ready to raise just a letter to fifty cents now. Exactly. Wow. So. Oh, the days. This this was what we had to have to do to buy our toys. We would go to the catalogs and the comic books, clip out the ad, ruin the comic itself <laughs> in the process, and we'd wait for what felt like six months before our toys would arrive, and and the packages were ma- in mangled condition. Yeah. Oh, so we go back to the party in the second story with Isis. Isis flies back and returns, and she has to to rectify the effects of that punch. Now, I didn't really understand what rectify meant. (laughs) I'm telling you, reading comic books and listening to to, uh, podcasts like ours, you're going to have an expanded vocabulary. Yeah. Yeah. I remember what you had said, John, and you're, you're correct about Adam West telling the penguin to get the water to slate his thirst. Yeah. We are learning a vocabulary here, reading comic books. You see, they have educational value. (laughs) And I would get in trouble for bringing a comic book to school. You know, I'm sure some of us have done that. But they had educational value. They could teach us a vocabulary and teach us what the female form was supposed to look like. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. But overall, the, the two stories, you enjoyed them? Yes, I did. I enjoyed them. Yeah. I enjoyed them. They were they were um, little stories. I they were simple. Yes, I enjoyed them. I think they were good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And again, we're still not at that point yet where the series really takes a weird turn. No, it's not really weird yet. If in a way you could say that it's still a little weird with the supernatural elements of uh, taking on these Egyptian gods, which is an appropriate villain to have, obviously. Right, because of Isis, who she is. But yeah, you're right. The comic has not taken an ultra weird approach yet. We're going to see that later on. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. We have a whole thing to t- talk about here in terms of an episode itself of Isis. You're right. <laughs> and and you're right. this is and this is going to be a big one because let me tell you. Here's the story of a lovely lady who was bringing up three very lovely girls. All of them had hair of gold, like their mother, the youngest one in curls. It's a story of a man named Brady, who was busy with three boys of his own. They were four men, living all together, yet they were all alone. It's the story of a boy named Anderson. (laughs) It is. It is. Tom Anderson. Nobody. I, oh my! I, until we get into the actual guest list, nobody's going to get that joke. <laughs> yeah. Now I wonder if he has five siblings, but I don't know. I could, be, I could be wrong. And a housekeeper. And a housekeeper. Yeah. There you go. Now, now people might start figuring things out. So, tell us what what's this episode called? This episode is called "To Find a Friend," and under the DVD insert in the episode guide that comes with the DVD set, it's called production number. 82013, written by Henry Coleman, directed by Hollingsworth Morris. And as I mentioned, this episode has someone of note here. I don't know if we even got into that with Joanna Pang Atkins in our interview with her. Mike Lookinland of Brady Bunch fame as Tom Anderson. Uh, because I know we, we brought up some of the other guest stars that appeared on ISIS. Nobody ever gives ISIS and Shazam enough credit for some of the great 60s, 70s, and future stars that appeared on the show. You're right, and no one does do that. I think it's because this show is considered just kids' fair and forgettable. And I really don't think that's fair to say it's forgettable. It is not forgettable. They're memorable, and that's why we're hence doing the podcast. It, it had good stories on a budget, 
and they had a slew of guest stars, just like you would expect any uh, Southern California produced television show that was appearing at the time on one of the three major networks. We also have to remember Shazam and Isis appeared on a major network. They appeared on CBS. And today you can have a thousand different cable channels, not counting even Netflix, and you won't know necessarily one television show from the other because that dilutes the audience the more networks you have and the more TV shows you had. But in 1975, John, this was the only choice that most people had, CBS, ABC, NBC. Yeah. And yeah. so it had a much larger share of the audience than TV, a lot of TV shows of today. So this show really is not given the kind of credit that I think it deserves in the types of guest stars they brought in. So who else do we have on this episode of the Seasons of Isis, or Secret uh, of Isis? On the Secrets of Isis, we've got Buddy Foster as Billy. Now, I know him better as the Wolf Boy on the Six Million Dollar Man episode, The Wolf Boy. I say Wolf Boy because that's the way Lee Majors pronounced it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Now, Buddy Foster, that not that uh, Jody Foster's brother? That is correct. Mm. He didn't have too many roles, though. Hmm. He can go on to do bigger and better things like his sister did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think uh, Wolf Boy was probably the biggest thing he did. Probably, <laughs> yeah. And he barely had any dialogue in the episode. Hmm. Yeah. He was he was a Wolf Boy. <laughs> okay. He's, uh, he's a Wolf Boy. He's a Wolf Boy. He's, he's a Wolf Boy. <laughs> I can imagine Lee Major. He, he's a Wolf Boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We also so cool. have Tommy Norton as Joe, Russ Marin as Mr. Anderson, and Christopher Norris as Joe's brother, although he doesn't get credit on screen. Hmm. Yeah. And and also we've got Albert Reed as Dr. Barnes oh, again. That's right, he's back. And he's listed as a cast a guest cast member. Yeah. go to this opening john yep and we see rick mason's cargo vehicle pull into the parking lot of the school Hi. i hope andrea likes it did you find tom yeah he's over at the field watching the mini bike races did you tell him he wasn't going with us he was really upset well it's his own fault you know he's really a pretty nice guy he just doesn't know how to make friends now, leave it again to Cindy Lee that she knows every kid in school. <laughs> she knows everybody and knows where they hang out and knows that they where they can make friends or not. <laughs> well, she she knows, and yet also Rick knows. I don't know, because it's interesting the, the way this one's set up in that there's Rick then also pointing out that it's Tom's own fault that he can't make friends. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I I don't know if uh, uh, I guess people do talk this way. They really do. Yeah, so and so, it's their own fault that they can't make any friends. <laughs> oh boy, I think it's true that people do speak like that. Uh, they can't well, get around that. Well, the thing I have with it is this, and we're still trying to figure this out. Is Cindy Lee a student just? Is she a teacher's assistant? What's like her deal? Is she a teenager? Sometimes I feel that Andrea and Rick don't talk as professionally with Cindy Lee as they should. Like Rick offering the comments, well, it's his own fault. He can't make big friends. I'm just thinking if I said that to another kid who's coming to me and like saying, oh, well, you know, this kid's got a problem. I mean, my thing should be empathy, not going, well, it's his own fault. You know, the sad thing is when I was in school, teachers would say that to me about other people, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or oh. they would say that to other people about me. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been through the ringer myself. Yeah. Huh. So, yeah, I think that that is a little awkward, but it's probably more factual than we care admit. So uh, what happens next? We see Bobby Brady. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, Tom, trying to barter for a ride on a mini bike. We go to the mini bike scene here where they're doing this obstacle course. Yep. And now rejected. He quickly sees another boy riding his bike and whose bike stops. 
and Tom going over to help adjust the spark plug wire and asks for a ride. Now, the boy doesn't want to give him a ride, so Tom offers to barter with his stopwatch. Now, the boy doesn't want a stopwatch. He doesn't want it. So Tom has the idea to get something else to barter with, which is a surprise. Yeah. The next shot features Rick saying, surprise to Andrea for her birthday. Now, that's a nice segue. That's That's what I was going to say. Yeah, it is a nice segue. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. I've got an idea. You wait here. I'll be right back. Where are you going? Just wait here. Who are you in for a surprise? Surprise, surprise. Surprise. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, birthday. Miss Thomas. Surprise. Move that, please. Make a wish. One candle for good luck, one for good health, and one to grow on. I thought I kept this a secret. How did you find out? Oh, there aren't many things in this school that I don't know about. Now, seriously, you're invited out to dinner. Your choice, my treat. A cake and dinner? There must be a catch here somewhere. There is. Mm-hmm. Well, now that it's come up, I'm taking Cindy and some of my six-period students on a field trip to the botanical gardens. Let me guess. You'd like me to handle the rest of the class. Why, are you a good guesser? Mm-hmm. And isn't that six period the one you're having a problem in? Well, sort of, yes. And isn't that problem's name Tom, Tom Anderson? Well, now that it's come up, um, <clears throat> Tom has caused a few problems. Do I get one more guess? Sure. Uh-huh. Tom Anderson isn't going on the field trip. He'll be in the sixth period class. You know, if this was a quiz show, you'd win the jackpot. It's a clever editing gimmick. Yep. Now, I don't know about you, but... Most of the time, if a teacher asks me, you want to come with us on a class trip, I'd be like, sure, I get out of the building for the day and I don't have to teach. Mm. (laughs) But Andrea is suspicious uh, because, of course, one of the kids in the class is Tom. Oh, take care of the problem, kid. Yep. 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 Andrea reluctantly agrees to watch Tom as he can't go on the trip anyway. And meanwhile, we see Tom return with the box and he's got his surprise Inside is an antique gun to give to Joe. Uh, But before we cut to that scene, we have to remember our friend Tut. (laughs) Oh, yes, Tut. (laughs) Tut the bird. Now, this bird, I like the bird. The bird is comic relief for me. I think he's meant to be comic relief. He's the Jar Jar Binks of (laughs) Shazam and Isis, okay? (laughs) That's bad, okay? That's a bad pun. Bad reference. But cut the cake. Cut the cake. Now he had at least learned to say that really fast, didn't he? How do how do birds do that? How did Tut do that? It's a wonder that Tut never says cut the cheese, cut the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so quickly away from this scene, we go back to the mini bike races again, right. right, John? So Joe's got the antique gun now he tests it by shooting out a headlight on one of the other bikes and this gets him thinking that with a gun like this he can make mr rabbit take notice it's interesting the way they drop the names in here like we're supposed to know what's going on like in the opening all right where's tom and you know and all this and it's like who's tom and now here's joe saying oh maybe mr rabbit will take notice so he drives off with the gun, leaving Tom behind, and Tom never gets his bike ride. No, no, no he never did. <laughs> See, that, that's a that's a breach of contract. The contract was verbally between him that he would get a bike ride in exchange for something to barter with. <laughs> so, in the meantime, this kid uh, Joe drops that he's going to do something with Mister Rabbit. Mister Rabbit's going to take notice. Yeah. Oh well. So that, that leaves us a clue as to what's going to happen later in the episode. But going back to the classroom, Tut has some of Andrea's birthday cake. I don't think it's too healthy for a bird to be eating, but <laughs> Cindy just, returns with... Huh? I was just, go ahead. They, they just let him go ahead at the cake. Isn't Andrea going to have any more? Uh, I guess not, huh? <laughs> uh, but Cindy returns with Rick from the field trip. That was a fast field trip. Okay. Yeah, right. Well, 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. enough for a commercial break uh, <laughs> but then Rick indicates that something is bothering him Andrea says 
that he doesn't have any friends. And they're talking about Tom, right? Right. Presumably Tom. So Rick says that Cindy, that Cindy knows he keeps spending his allowance on the kids. Cindy Lee knows everything again. <laughs> I mean, why did they get rid of Cindy Lee in the second season of The Secrets of Isis? She knows everything about the guest characters that we'll never see again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to see if... Oh, God, I'm blanking on her name now. If she's as knowledgeable as Cindy Lee in the second season. Right. Yeah. Rennie Carroll. Rennie. That's the new yeah. character. Yeah. Yeah, we'll meet her next season. Yeah. So Rick was going to have a talk with him the next day, but Andrea says it should be today. He may be headed for trouble. Mm. Now, the next thing, they go to the mini bike races, and Cindy Lee is there judging the races and says that Billy wins fair and square. So she's one of the judges. Right. Well, well Tom accuses him of starting sooner than the rest of them. Rick happens to be there. He interrupts them, and Tom shoves Billy, and Rick breaks it up and confronts him about not being in class. You know, Tom, that's no way to win friends. Well, he asked for it, did he? Let's get right to the point. You weren't in class today. Well, something happened. I had some trouble. And what are you going to do with it? Carry it around on your back? I guess so. Are you afraid to ask for help? Yes, ma'am. Well, you shouldn't be. That's what we're for. Look, I don't want you to get involved. I guess I should go to the police. The police? How serious is this? Serious enough. Listen, why don't you tell us about it? Well, I took something I shouldn't have. You stole it? I didn't. The kid I showed it to did. Well, what was it, Tom? A gun. Dramatic prose, dun, 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 and then we go to commercial break. Yeah. Next, we hear Tom relate what Joe looks like and describes him to Andrea and to Rick, too. Now, Rick takes Tom while Andrea tells him to call the police. She has something else to do first. Why would she say that? <laughs> Why is she dropping a clue? I got something else to do first. Well, what's more what else important? Could be yeah. Important? Yeah. What else could be so important that she doesn't go along with Rick and Tom yeah. to track down a missing gun? Of course, we know she will become ISIS, but why preface it out loud? <laughs> so, well, all I can I, say is, thank God Andrea's there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she, she's there just in time. She might have to save us from Cindy Lee's uh, blue uh, overalls. Those things are bright. <laughs> Well, because if she didn't, there's Rick saying, first thing, we got to tell Tom's father. And the second thing is to look for Joe. What about calling the police? <laughs> Call the police, report a missing gun. Oh, dear. <laughs> I mean, at least Andrea, all right, for whatever else, I've got something else to do. At least says, well, go call the police. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Couldn't this have been done without... ISIS intervening at this point. I think it could have, but you know, we got to make use of the character. Right. And, and so we have to put her in early in the episode. We don't want to keep kids hanging to the very end when ISIS comes and saves the day. Right. Mighty ISIS. So she uses her amulet to see what's played out between Tom and Joe. Time. Turn back, and in your flight, let me see what is gone from sight. Red hair, black leather jacket, yellow mini bike. Wish I could see where he went. The whole thing with her using her amulet to see the whole thing being played back, it's weird. It's the first time we ever see her sort of looking into the recent past. I mean, she can hear the the gun going off and the motorbike, but she can't seem to hear them talking to each other. Hmm. You know? And then she's True. like, oh, and I wish I knew where he went. I'm like thinking, you can't 
keep going with this. And, you know, to me, it's like just very specific. It sort of fills her in without having characters there. And at the same time, it doesn't give her all the information. Do you see what I'm getting at? It's 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 uh, just a weird plot point. Yeah, it is. It's a little strange. But yeah. I'm curious to know how how is Isis able to see this if it's playing in her amulet because her amulet is strapped to her forehead. <laughs> it's her mind's eye. Oh, okay. Her mind's <laughs> eye. That's what, <laughs> that's what it's supposed to communicate because when you look at that amulet, you see all those smoke, the smoke swirling and all of those kinds of things. Right. And if she if it's in her if it's in her mind, I can understand that. But yeah. Why they show us that it's in the amulet that she's watching it like a television thing? Will she take it off and look at it? Or she just keeps it on her head. I don't know. <laughs> and the, and All the right. thing is, too, she's like, I I don't know where he went. It's like, well, you even at least have a basic de- direction because as you're watching the scene, he drives off. Follow in that direction. At least you got something. I don't know. I I just didn't like it. It it was it was a very limited power. And there was no explanation as to why it was limited. And it sort of frustrated the whole story as far as I'm concerned. It did. It frustrated it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, that it, it opens up some unanswered questions. I don't think it was necessary for her to do that because the unanswered questions would be, well, she can see him clearly. Why can't she use a spell and conjure up where he went? I mean, it's, it would naturally seem to flow that that's what would happen. But – they're trying to tell us a story that she has some power to be able to see the recent past. And so uh, that makes a little bit of sense. And, of course, we see her do all sorts of things like f- stop time and so on. That I think giving a character like Isis too many powers can cause complications in other plot lines. True. Like, again, why couldn't she save Lucky? <laughs> <laughs> Let me go Lucky. back to the dog again. He's going to be a frequent reference in the future reviews of I- Secrets of Isis episodes. Why couldn't she save Lucky? Oh, poor Lucky. <laughs> but she can sure keep a gun out of a hand of a teenager. <laughs> no, that's yeah. true. Yeah. I, and and the, here's the thing. That gun is so old. We find out at Tom's house later on because the father is clearly disappointed yes. in Tom and giving it up. We find out it's so old. It's an old war souvenir the mechanism is rusted and it could explode at any moment. It, well, not any moment, but like in being triggered, it could be triggered the wrong way and cause an explosion. Yeah. We find out about that. Well, while, while uh, da- Tom's dad is chewing him out. Yeah. Now something is missing here. Rick was with Tom without Andrea. Now we see them arrive together. <laughs> Obviously a little bit of time has passed. Okay, I can understand a few minutes have passed, perhaps. Right. Did she turn into Andrea Thomas and stand on the roadway and say, Oh, here come and get me? Like, wait a minute, how did she get all the way over here, Andrea? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would that give away a clue? But I don't know. So next we see that Joe uses his older brother to buy ammunition. And meantime, Rick, Andrea, and Cindy and Tom go through yearbooks trying to find him. Yeah. Andrea asks about the mini bike, and she, Andrea asks about what the color of the bike. And Cindy asks that this boy could be out of school. So Rick has a checklist of those who dropped out of school and have part-time jobs. Wow, that should take up another 25% of the student body. <laughs> <laughs> who does that? That's pretty good detective work. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Cindy and Andrea go in one direction while Rick and Tom go in another. That's that's a cliche. You go this way, we'll go the other way. That's another story cliche in a lot of plot lines. But we, we find also, that a lot Well, we get stories. that cliche in more 70s and 80s shows than modern shows. And we also get the cliche of the montage of their investigation. Yes, yes, you're right. You're right about that. The montage of the investigation, all the places they go, all the questions they're asking... That that is true. I don't think things go quite like that in real life, just because of the advent of, of smartphones and technology. Uh, that saves a lot of storytelling time. But yeah. you're right. That's a cliche, and it's told here. And I think they do a pretty good job of that. Yeah, I agree. So Rick and Tom get to a basketball court, and they find the wrong person. They meet up with no results. 
Tom's father finally meets up to tell them that the police called to say that ammunition was sold that would fit his gun. <laughs> wow, that must be a rare antique gun to find some special ammo that is seldom sold. <laughs> So Andrea asked Tom if he can remember anything Joe said that might give them a clue. And she tells him to think hard while she flashes him her amulet. Now, did anyone else see her do this? <laughs> Apparently not. That is kind of a neat trick. That, that's a kind of a neat trick. I like that. But you see the flashing of the amulet and you see the reflection on his face. Now, how did Andrea know that that would do that? She must know a lot about this amulet. When she found it in the desert, did it come with instructions? <laughs> <laughs> she remembers that he said, wouldn't old Mr. Rabbit sit up and take notice of this? That was the clue from earlier in the episode. Now this we're going to be heading towards a payoff on this pretty right. soon. So we know that this character, Joe, has gone hunting. Now the, the group of people split up again to check out hunting grounds. Yeah. Next, we see now they go up to split hunt, find hunting grounds. That's a lot of ground to cover, especially when they're driving from the city into some hunting grounds. That would take them some time. You would think, but Andrea and Cindy find the boys quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so next, minutes. we see Joe bike. That's right. We see them on their way to hunting, and the party search. Andrea and Cindy happen to be at the gate where the boys <laughs> enter. They find them quickly, just like you said, John. Yeah. So, getting Cindy out of the way to call the police, days without cell phones. Almighty ice, 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 ice. And it becomes Isis for the second time in the episode. Yeah. So, here's where we're introduced to one, an, another cliche in the Shazam Isis Hour, which we love. We absolutely love this, okay? Stock footage, rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Stock footage, rabbit. Couldn't they have borrowed the tricks, rabbit? from the serial commercial. Mm -hmm. I would have gone out of my way to shoot that thing, but that's... <laughs> so, now, Isis, what she does is that she sees this go on. She uses her power to do something that I don't think we've seen in, in another episode so far, John. She stops all of time and goes to disarm Joe. Time, the ruler of day, frees this moment and make it stay. So uh, the trees and the grass are still moving. If you look at the frame carefully, they're still moving. So time hasn't completely stopped. Now, this opens up a whole can of worms. Has time stopped for the entire world? It seems or that has way. It, has it stopped just for Southern California? <laughs> I would think it's the whole world. You know, uh, other, otherwise, you know, for those few moments, they're behind and everybody else in the rest of the world's ahead. It gets weird. This second, this minute, this hour of a day, continue now on your ceaseless way. So all the time on the on the interstate on Interstate Five stops. Okay, yeah. the cars stop. But the edge of the highway where the time hasn't stopped. There's gonna be a lot of car crashes. Okay. <laughs> Isis, you've been very foolish, Joe. Let me show you what might have happened. Oh boy. If you didn't come by and stop me. Maybe you can now understand what happens when you do things you shouldn't. Like playing with guns. Boy, do I ever. Again, if she can stop time to take a gun out of a hand of a wayward teenager, why couldn't she have rescued Lucky? <laughs> oh, Lucky, you could have been saved. Oh, well. <laughs> she could have gone back in time and kept him from drowning. Yeah. Uh, we're lucky. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure Lucky went on to do an Apple commercial. He was fine. <laughs> yeah. And later on, we see Joe and Tom working on a booth for the school carnival. Tom has talked Joe into going back to school, and they are both going to juvie counseling, something we <laughs> haven't heard before. We've heard juvie, but we've never heard about juvie counseling. It must be a diversion program of some kind. I, I you know, I, I don't handle juvenile cases myself, but, yeah, I think that's what it would be. There's still that little bit there, as Andrea also proves how difficult it is for people to remember things they saw 
by betting Rick he doesn't know what color his bow tie is and he fails, which is interesting. I don't think I've ever done that. But then again, my students have said to me in the past, you wear too much green. And sure enough, I brought that story up to my current students and they were laughing at that. And what did I do the very next day after saying that I came in wearing a green shirt and they pointed out maybe there is something to it. Yeah, there, there may very well be. I think some folks don't pay too much attention to those kinds of details. And that's, that's a very clever little way to end it. It was a cute way to end it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, let me ask you. Stunts? Well, there was nothing that I saw, except you want to consider taking a gun out of a guy who's playing freeze frame and tossing it a stunt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know about that, John. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the fashion wise I mean Rick's bow tie right Rick's bow tie what is it with bow ties I mean that bow tie was huge it's just like as as bad as those wide ties that are are, are regular ties that are just as bad Uh, that was distracting (laughs) Mm. we will return to ISIS after these messages In the news, an ice skating superstar. At the Winter Olympics this year, Diane Deleu won a silver medal. Today, Diane is working hard on a new kind of skating career. In the news. In the news is sponsored by Nabisco. You'll find quality in our corner. Hi, gang! (laughs) Big Fig here with that great new dance, the Newton. (laughs) <laughs> Hit it, Al. Fat is ooey, gooey, rich and chewy inside. Golden, flaky, tender, cakey outside. Wrap the inside in the outside. Is a good charm, too? Doing a big, gooey, big, gooey, Newton. Here's the tricky part. The big, gooey, big, gooey, Newton. One more time. The big, 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 Newton. Years of training and hard work go into the winning of an Olympic medal. But what happens to an athlete once the dream has been achieved? Diane Deleu, the silver medalist at the Winter Olympics, has not retired from ice skating. She is now the star of a touring ice show, something quite to her liking. I'm finding it that I have to go out there every night and give a performance, which in the past I'd be training and working up for one big event a year. Now you go out there and you just do your number, and it's a great relaxed feeling. You just are out there to enjoy yourself and have the people enjoy you. Diane was born in California, but in the Olympics she skated for the Netherlands. Both her parents are Dutch, and that means Diane is both an American citizen as well as a citizen of the Netherlands. She chose to skate for the Netherlands six years ago. People made it seem like I had just gone to the Netherlands that year, but I had been competing there for six years in the national championships, and I originally went there to represent the Netherlands in international competition because in the United States it's really hard to get into international competition. They can only send three from this whole country. And so I went there when I was 14 and right away I made the world team and started competing. Really got a lot of experience. Diane Deleu is now skating toward a new goal as an ice show star in the news. show tonight at 6.30 on 8. Our dream house. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait to move in. Let's send everyone our new address. But the house won't be ready for six weeks. Look, we want our bank statements on time. Yeah. And our credit card. Yeah. And charge account bill. You're right. Your post office has a free change of address kit with cards to tell everyone exactly when you're moving. Better make sure you tell everyone our right address. Get the change of address kit from your post office or mailman. It makes things go smoother after you move. And now, back to ISIS. In today's story, Tom learned that he couldn't buy friendship. Real friends are those who like you for yourself, not because you give them presents. And Tom learned something else. He learned that a gun is not a toy. A lot of people are sorry because they've been hurt by a gun they thought was unloaded. So, play it safe. Don't play with a gun. Then you'll never be sorry. See you next week. 
All right. So the moral of this episode. Never play with a gun. <laughs> ah, shucks. There goes my weekends, John. <laughs> I think it's a little more than that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, there's, they're trying to give us a moral grounded in reality. That's That sounds good, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> you can't buy friendship, though Lord knows I've tried. You can't? No. Oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, there goes my plans for next weekend. <laughs> I can't I... play with them, but I can't buy friendship. Shucks. Well, if you think about it, this is one of those episodes where we actually get two morals, which I think we had once or twice in Shazam as well. It is, you know, guns are not toys. And then there's also the message about friendship. You're correct about that. We get a double moral in this episode. I think it's very strong in that way. I think it. the whole episode was not geared just towards that one moral, don't play with a gun. That's what we get in the uh, moral at the very end, the moral tag. But really, the overall message, I thought, was exactly that. You cannot buy friendship. And so Tom learns a lesson that he has to go out and engage people and make friends that way. And as the episode resolves itself, Joe ends up going back to school. And so uh, they both end up in some kind of juvenile diversion. <laughs> they have to toss that in. I don't know why they need to do that for. But that uh, I think it, the show resolves itself very well there. Right. Now, the question is, does it hold up? I think so. I think so. I think it holds up. <sighs> See, I don't know. Maybe. I guess. I don't find this to be the most exciting episode. And there's some odd editing choices, I thought, early on in the story. It is interesting to note how on Isis, she refers to the story more in her moral when she's talking about it. she'll bring up the characters and stuff compared to in Shazam where Marvel or Billy just simply talk in more general terms that relate to the story. But overall, I don't know. Do you think it's the, the, the giving of the moral tag at the end that's too narrow? In her case? No, in her case, she's very specific, you know, as I say, mentioning even the characters' names, so that it's like, okay, so this way we remember it, you know, that uh, this happened to Tom, and Tom shouldn't have done this. But Captain Marvel and Billy don't get as specific. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But well, uh, I think it's I think it's good so so far. I think I I like the insight that you provided that we we really are introduced to two moral messages here. They're not conflicting at all. It's about being careless with firearms, and it's about not buying friendship. Yeah. Now, how would you rate this though on the scale of one to five tuts? I would rate this five out of five tuts, John. Really? Okay. I, th I consider it high because I do think that the moral is good, or morals, there's, there's a good moral to uh, the character arc of this boy. He manages to make friends, and he manages to help, in essence, turn another guy around, too, who was heading the wrong way. And it was grounded in reality. It wasn't too fantastical. And other than the stoppage of time, which was a little hokey, uh, I thought it was well-grounded in reality. I guess. I don't know. I just found it to be pretty standard fare. I, I wasn't that interested in the story overall. I don't know. It, it seemed forced. And I know that sounds weird because we're talking about this 70s TV show and such. But the whole thing just seemed forced. Like, this is the moral we want to do. How do we go about it? And then it's not as well played out, I thought, as some of the other episodes. It's okay. I'd watch it again, but not the most interesting, I, could, I thought. It's a good episode to watch, and it's good to see Mike Lookinland play a different role besides Bobby Brady, and I thought he did fine. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So, folks, that's going to do it for this episode of the Shazam! Isis podcast. Tune in next time, in which... I guess I'm going to use politically correct terminology here. A right, uh, a right, a height challenge student is trying to show he's more than what you see 
in the episode, The Show Off. We continue our look at ISIS and we'll also continue our look with the fourth issue of the comic book. That's on our next episode. So until then, folks, thank you so much for listening. Make sure you head on over to the Facebook page, the Shazam ISIS podcast.com website. Also subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Google Play, or any of those great podcast players that are available for you to listen to the podcast because we're there. So until next time, folks, thank you so much for listening. Once again, Richard, everyone, take care. Take care, everyone, and thank you for listening to our podcast. Mm-hmm.